Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you could kindly make your way down front, we're going to get this church service started the way every good southern church service should start, like this. I came here to tell you something, I came here to let you know. I came here to tell you something, I came here to let you know. Came to drop this baggage that's been dragging down my soul. I came here to tell you something, I came here to let you know. Yeah, I found myself forgiveness in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I came here to tell you something, I came here to let you know. <laughs> tell you something I came here to let you know I came here to give you something I came here to get the show my body soul and spirit no longer mine they are all yours and I came here to tell you something I came here to let it show I don't care if they don't believe me yeah I'm dealing with the Holy Ghost I came here to tell you something I came here to let you know something I came here to let you know I came here to tell you something I came here to let you know I came here to tell you something I came here to let you know I came here to tell you something I came here to let you know good morning living stones how you doing glad to be here I want to teach you a new song you guys up for learning a new song you have to say yes, right? We've been over this. You, you, you have to say yes. Okay. The chorus of the song goes like this. Hallelujah. No one greater. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Oh, you gave yourself broken on that tree. Yourself. Who's going to try that with me? Okay, thank you for your honesty. Let's try it. Hallelujah, no one greater. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Oh, you gave yourself broken on that tree. Let's try it together.
Calvary. I feel its cleansing power, and that's enough for me. basketball a lot and um, we put together a church team this was when I still lived in Atlanta and we put together a, a team for this church league and we showed up for our first game nervous because it was kind of a motley crew a ragtag group I, I fancied myself a bit of a baller and then we had this other dude who had played college basketball so I thought we had a chance but you never know so we played the first game and, and we actually won it's feeling pretty good about ourselves the next week we come back again and we're warming up we're taking you know we're just taking practice shots and stuff and where's the other team it's almost time so all of a sudden this other team shows up and it's like this happens in slow motion the doors swing open and these guys just come sauntering through these big guys obviously we're outmatched at this point it's like you know these guys were athletes they they came to win they planned to win and i'll just skip to the end they won they not only won, they embarrassed us. They would do things like telling us what was going to happen. Like, like um, you know, one of us is dribbling, and, and the guy from the other team would be like, you think that's your ball? That's my ball. I'm going to take that ball. And then he would steal the ball, and he would, you know, lay it in and score. So it was pretty humiliating and humbling. Um, but, you know, <laughs> these guys knew they had the power to do something. They told us they were going to do it. And then they backed it up. And the only thing worse than a trash talker when you're playing sports is a trash talker that, that backs it up by actually doing what they say they're going to do, right? So um, I was thinking about this next song we're going to do. The first two lines say, there's no end to your power, Lord. There's no limit in you. What if I lived my life actually believing that my, Holy, my Heavenly Father had the power to do what he said he was going to do, Right? You know, like, uh, it's probably a terrible analogy because those guys were jerks, right? And Jesus is not a jerk, for those of you who don't know him. He's, he's, he's wonderful. But Jesus has the power to back up what he's going to say he's going to do, and he'll even say, hey, watch this, like right before he does it. That's, what, that's been my experience. It's for so many of you, I know it's the same thing. So for me, this song celebrates God's infinite power and his ability to speak into our lives and just say, hey, you know, rest in me, rest in my promises. The Bible tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, right? We have access to that power. It's alive in us every day. I, I wish that every day I lived my life like I believed that because there are moments that I don't. Those watch this moments that God has performed in my life, they're, they're constant and yet I tend to doubt it. So let's proclaim this song over one another right now. He moves the mountains and parks the waters. He does what he says he's gonna do. I wouldn't call it trash talking, that we should come up with a better term, you know, peace talking or love talking or something, but he speaks those things into our lives every day, and this song is a proclamation of those promises. Let's sing it together. This song is called Giants.
Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, for your goodness, for your power, for your majesty, Father, we come with grateful hearts. We lift up your name. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'd speak through Chris now as he comes to teach us from your word. I pray that you would just make our hearts open to whatever you want to say to us, Lord, that not one of us would be um, the same, that we would not leave unchanged, Father. Again, for your promises of abundant life, Father, we worship you, we praise you. And it's in the holy and matchless name of our Savior, Jesus, that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome, Living Stones. That was awesome. Thank you. Good stuff. The first one they did was a Kevin Lawson original. Am I right with that? That was, uh, it was written by him. That's one of my favorite Kevin Lawson songs. And, of course, you can download his music on Spotify and whatever. He's got a new album out called Now is Perfect. And uh, good music. Worth the uh, money that you spend on it. I think so. And uh, Gary Woods has his entourage back there with him. He's got his uh, extended family, his son, and who else? <laughs> All kinds of people back there with Gary. He's like, the, he's like the key to church growth. Just get somebody like him. And he's always involved. i got to tell you a funny story. <laughs> we, we, have, like we have a Wednesday night Bible study at his house. And, uh, and every Wednesday night, we have a different person there like a new person, right? And it's because, and I'm not kidding you, like he will be walking around outside on the street or something and meet somebody and he'll say, hey, my name is Gary, you should come to my Bible study tonight. It's on Wednesday night, you should come, right? Like, and you'd think, you know, who would ever show up? But they do. And, and they show up all the time. It's amazing. And um, so, so last night, or last Wednesday night, we had a, uh, we had a, a, a Mormon, an elder. The, an elder in the Mor- in the Mormon church, and he was in our Bible study. Great guy. We had a great time, great time with him. And so this happens like weekly. No kidding. Like I'm not exaggerating. Like it's almost every Wednesday we've got somebody new because he ran into him in the street or someplace and just <laughs> invited him to a Bible study. So last week, right, I am I was up on my little scooter checking the surf at the pier, and I'm just kind of sitting there on my, my bike, and I'm wa- looking at the water, and this random guy comes up to me, and he just says, hey, he goes, hey, how fast does that thing go? And I said, oh, 35, you know, and so we're talking about, you know, he's looking to move down here and all this kind of stuff, and, and he gets a phone call. It's his wife, and I can hear him on the phone. He kind of steps away a little bit, and I hear him say, oh, I found the perfect house. I said, you know, it's just a few houses from the beach. If you go to the second floor, you can actually see the ocean from the second floor. And, uh, and you know, the, and the neighbor actually had a key to the house, and he let me in. He showed me the house, and now oh, he's got this beautiful new pool that he just built. And so he was saying this as he's walking away, and I wasn't really paying attention. And then as he was walking away, I thought to myself, that sounds like Gary, <laughs> right? And so uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go ask him. So... I scooted down, and I caught up to him, and he was still on the phone, so I didn't bother him. I thought, ah, whatever. That probably wasn't him. (laughs) So last Wednesday night, guess who's at the Bible study? (laughs) No kidding. Because he was looking at the house next door to Gary. Gary let him in, and he guy shows up. (laughs) I looked at the guy. I said, do I look familiar to you? (laughs) And he says, no. I said, I'm that dork that was on the scooter that you were talking. And he's like, no kidding. So, small world, but uh, every church should have a Gary Woods, right? So, wood, well done. And I, I got to be honest with you. I mean, I've been in the ministry for 30 years, and I'm learning from him. I'm learning from him because, you know what? I mean, he, he has no fear. And I thought to myself, why am I afraid? Like, why am I afraid to invite people? You know, you sometimes like, I don't know if I should do it. And uh, it's amazing. I mean, and he's been a great example for me in one way. Many others know. But in <laughs> Speaking of which, though, we have, and I, this, I didn't plan this, but this is a, uh, we, have, we have little business cards that are printed up. They're on the back table. And the purpose for these little business cards is to invite people, right? And this is 
a card that has everything on it that you would need uh, to invite somebody to church or, or um, uh, you know, or witness to them. And so what I do is I just keep a stack of these in my pocket at all times and we'll hand them out when I have opportunity. So we have a stack on the back table. If you want to take some of those and put them in your pocket, that would be great. Also, we have new stickers for your windows and you guys can pick those up. So I think the advertisement section of today's sermon is over. All right, are you ready? Luke 8. Luke 8, we're going to be looking at verses 43 through 48. Luke 8, 43 through 48. Let me pray. Our Father, once again, we are venturing into this time when uh, we know that you have um, created the ministry of the Word of God to bring about change and transformation. So be with our time today. And once again, I ask that our, our hearts would be softened, that our minds would be open, that, that we would not only understand the things that you have written in this book, this wonderful treasure, but that we would be able to unearth them and handle them responsibly. And that, um, that we would take these truths and, and embrace them by faith and be transformed by them. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. You have one of these on your air conditioner. It's, a, it's an energy tag, right, that, uh, that will show you what your air conditioning system uh, is, is drawing as far as energy goes. And it'll give you an energy efficiency rating and all that. But, you know, the purpose of that is just to tell you how much power it's drawing. And, of course, we live in an age where everybody wants to be green and energy efficient. And so the least amount of power that you draw, the better. The lower your electric bill is. Energy efficiency is key. I mean, you can go out to a, a store now and you want to buy a light bulb, you can buy a 9-watt LED bulb that produces the same amount of lumens or brightness as a 60-watt incandescent bulb. So you dr you're drawing uh, so much less energy and producing the same amount of light. It's the opposite when it comes to the things of God. Because God is not green. He's not interested in energy efficiency, and this is what I mean by that. God, as we sang this morning, has inexhaustible resources of power. He is a God of infinite, in, infinite, infinite power, right? And he tells us that he desires that you and I drain that power, that we... We, we withdraw that power from him and so that it would enter our own lives. We, he wants us to be power drainers. And so our goal is not to drain as little, as, as little as energy and power as, as we can, but to drain as much. And so, this morning we're going to see, how is it as a believer in Jesus Christ, can I be a, a power drainer? Can I transfer the power that God possesses into my life. There is a woman in our story this morning who does that, who is going to teach us all about it. Luke 8, let's look at verse 43. And before we do this, let's set the context. Remember last week, we found that there was a, a, a man named Jairus who was in a, a desperate state. And if you remember, that desperate state was that he had an only daughter who was 12 years old who was deathly ill. And so he falls at the feet of Jesus Christ, and, and he begs him, would you please come to my house and heal my daughter? And as we said last week, that makes a lot of sense until you, you learn who the guy is. The text says that he is an official in the synagogue, and he's part of the religious establishment. And the religious establishment, the scribes and the Pharisees, are out to kill him. They're conspiring to kill him, to take him out, because Jesus is threatening them. He's exposing their hypocrisy. He's challenging the religious establishment by calling them whitewashed tombs and brood of vipers and sons of Satan. And so he's got people following him, and he's telling them. And so they get really concerned about this guy, and, and he's threatening their little kingdom that they built for themselves. And so they figure out we're going to kill him. Jairus, however, is in a different situation, although he may belong to the opposing team. The, the, the thing is, is that he's got something else in his life 
that's making him push that all aside. I mean, the issue that he's dealing with with his daughter eclipses any religious affiliation or you know, being on the opposing team no longer matters because he's heard what Jesus is able to do. He's heard that he has produced these miracles and he thinks to himself, my daughter's dying. I don't care what team I'm on. I'm going to fall at his feet and I'm going to beg him to heal my daughter. And he's on his way. And Jesus agrees. He heads off towards Jairus' house and there is a crowd that is pressing in on them and following them. And I imagine that go, the going to Jairus' house was, was, was slow. And then while he was going, Jesus stops dead in his tracks. And I am sure much to the chagrin of Jairus because time is of the essence for him. But someone stops him dead in his tracks. It's a person who, as well, is in a desperate situation. Let's go to our text. Look at verse 43. And a woman who had suffered a chronic flow of blood for 12 years and could not be helped by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus said, Who was the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, uh, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had left me. Now when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and admitted in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well, <laughs> go in peace. So you can imagine the crowd. I mean, it's kind of like the, the scene in my mind. You know, you imagine, if, you know, you see somebody on TV who is a person of notoriety and they have a, a crowd around them. The press is trying to get pictures of them and people are trying to get near them and they have bodyguards and they're trying to make their way someplace and people are pressing in. And I kind of I kind of think that this scene looks similar to that. People are pressing in on him and they're following Jesus as they're, as they're on their way to um, uh, Jairus' house, and, you know, people are crowding, and, and probably the, the, the progress is, is slow, and then, and then all of a sudden, Jesus stops, and he asks a question, who touched me? Well, it's kind of an odd question, because Peter reveals, well, there's a lot of people touching you. Peter looks at him and he says, are you crazy? He says, look at the crowd. People are pressing in on you and people are touching you. Who touched me? Seriously? (laughs) Everybody's touching you. He says, no, 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 no. If somebody touched me because I felt power drain. Huh. Just then, (laughs) the woman who touched him knows that he's talking about her. And she's fearful for whatever reason, but she comes up in front of Christ and she falls down at his feet and she confesses to him and to everybody else, I am the one who touched you. And as soon as I touched you, I was healed. The text gives us a bit of a backstory about this woman. The text says that she has been ill for the past 12 years, long time to be sick. And the kind of illness that she suffered was an illness where she was hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging for 12 years. And so to put it delicately, she was in her, she was that, it was that time of the month for her for 12 years. Constantly bleeding. And you can imagine that if somebody is bleeding that much over such a long period of time, the physical hindrances and pain that go along with that. I mean, I could imagine that she was probably anemic for those 12 years. I would imagine that she, was, uh, she had iron deficiency and she probably was extremely weak, probably could not work, probably had a difficult time even just doing normal everyday chores. What an effect this has had on her. And not just the fact that she is uh, affected by this physically, but there's also a social element to this. I mean, everywhere you go, you had to prepare for your bleeding all the time. And and what a nightmare that would be. As well, 
the Hebrew law states that if a woman is in that time of the month, that she is considered unclean, and that she has to kind of social distance from everybody else. And if anybody touches her while during this time, they are unclean. So this is a nightmare for her. The Gospel of Mark tells us in his recording of this account that she has spent all of her money on doctors to no avail. And so she hears that Jesus is nearby, and she hears the miracles that he has produced, and she thinks to herself, all I have to do is touch his coat, and I'll be healed. She doesn't think like Jairus. Jairus thought to himself, I need to fall at the feet of Jesus and, 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 and you know, be on bended knee and, be, and confront him and look at him in the eye and, and say, please come with me. She's not thinking like that. The text says that she comes up behind him and she thinks to herself, if I just grab his cloak, I will be healed. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. You know what's amazing? <laughs> is that there is one person in that crowd who was healed. Only one. Right? How many are people in the crowd? I don't know. But only one is healed. Are there people pressing up against him and bumping into him? Yeah. Are any of them healed? No. Only one. So whenever you, uh, you get to a passage like this, and uh, maybe you're, you're studying it in your own devotion time, one of the quick, good questions you want to ask when approaching a text like this, regards to application, is you want to ask yourself, who do I identify with? Who in the story do I identify with? The question is, do I identify with the crowd or do I identify with the woman? Right? Again, the crowd is following along. They have great interest in Jesus and they're, and they're pressing up against him. They want to be near him. But what's fascinating is that with all of these people pressing up against them, the only time power is drained is when the woman touches him. and doesn't even touch him. It just touches his cloak. And I would imagine that there's people in that crowd that had problems, issues, sicknesses, stuff in their lives that they probably would love to have Jesus heal. And they're pressing up against him. And there's no power leaving his body for them. There's power leaving his body only for one person. And immediately, as soon as she touches him, she is healed. So who do you identify with? I think if you were honest, and I were honest, I think most of us, most of the time, identify with the crowd. There's sort of a casual relationship to Jesus. They're, they're following along, there's, there's interest, and they're bumping into him every once in a while. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a distance, and you contrast that to the, to the, the place where the woman is, of complete desperation and, and seeking him earnestly. So... I think most of us would identify with the crowd if we're honest, right? When we go to church on Sundays, right? I mean, we go to church most Sundays unless it's a really nice beach day like today. Or if there's surf, all bets are off, right? But most of us would do that. I mean, we, we go to church, and, 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 and even we go to a small group. We might attend a small group and be very involved. You know, we might even be involved in ministry. You know, we, 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 we may even be part of the greeter team, right? When the pastor's wife calls you and asks you if you want to be a greeter, what are you going to say? No. Missy calls you, you got to say yes, right? So maybe you serve, maybe you're set up and break down, maybe, maybe you get involved certain ways and, 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 you know, you just, you have that relationship with Christ and it's, all of it's good and it should be there, but, but, you know, maybe even you say grace before dinner or, you know, you have the Christian radio station on on your way to church to kind of get you in the mood, you know, and as a Christian, you kind of have all of these, all your ducks in a row and all these things that are in place that ought to be there, and that's all good. And then every once in a while, you're, you're kind of bumping into them. But you're part of the crowd. But let me ask you something. Have you ever stopped him dead in his tracks? Have you ever reached out for him in such a way that he stopped dead in his tracks? 
because of you and your touch? When was the last time any power transferred from him to you? See, the difference between the crowd and this woman (laughs) is that the woman reached down and she touched him with a faith that was born out of desperation. It was that desperation. It was her 12-year illness, incredible suffering. She's at her wit's end. There's no other solution. She hears him and she says, he's my only hope. And out of that desperation, she reaches for him because he know, she knows that he's the only answer. And it's because of that reach and that touch and that faith that she exhibits that power transfers from him to her and to nobody else. Because it was a faith that was born out of, out of desperation. The last time you saw God move in your life was probably the last time you were desperate. Can you remember that time? You remember that time when you found yourself in a situation where you had nowhere else to go? And you reached out and God entered your life in a way that perhaps you had never seen him enter before? And it's that desperation, it's that faith that is produced in difficult circumstances that transfers the power of God into my life. And folks, sometimes God will put me in that desperation, that that position of desperation to produce that faith so that I might see him work in a way that I've never seen him work before. And I'm not talking about the everyday work that God has in my life. And that is all praiseworthy, and it's good. Because he provides for me every day. He gives me life every day. I wake up in the morning because of him. My life is sustained by the power of his word. Every day, God sustains me. In him, we live and we move and we have our being. And that is wonderful. And it's God's wonderful, miraculous provision. But I'm talking about the kind of, the time when God enters your life in a way that is miraculous. And you stand back and you (laughs) go, whoa, wow. You know, every time Moses walked by a body of water, it didn't part. True? I mean, he could walk by a lake and waters in that lake didn't part, did they? Or he could walk by the sea and, on an average day, and, and those waters didn't part. But one time, those waters parted. Why? <laughs> because Moses found himself and the nation of Israel in a situation that was desperate. Remember, they left Egypt, and God led them out, and so they're walking you know, through the wilderness, and they get to the shores of the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh comes to his senses. Remember? And Pharaoh says, what have I done letting these people go? All this free labor out the door, I got to get them back. What am I doing? And so Pharaoh takes his army and he's chasing them. So Israel sees the approaching Egyptian army and they're at the shores of the Red Sea. They're boxed in. I mean, it's, they got no place to go. And that's when God parts the waters. That's when God enters the life of in the experience of Israel, and he says, let me show you who I am. And they walk across dry land, and as soon as they get to the end, the other, other side, right, and the Egyptian army is crossing over as well, what does God do? The waters fold back into place, and the Egyptian army is drowned, and they put together a pile of rocks on the other side, and that pile of rocks is basically an altar or a milestone so that Israel would look back at those pile of rocks and say, do you remember what God did? That's exactly what God does in our lives. When he intervenes in such a way, outside of the normal average everyday work that he does in my life, it is a milestone so that I can go back and say, remember when God did that? When he he intervened and he stepped into my life in, in such a way that was absolutely miraculous? I was talking to Betty 
about a year ago in the back of the church. Do you remember Betty's friends with Beverly? Anyway, she'd been coming to, she'd been coming to Livingstone for quite a while. And so one day after church, she says, come here, I've got to talk to you. So I'm sitting in the back, on the back row with her, and, and, and she's telling me about this story about her finances. And she says, you know, I'm commercial real estate. She goes, Chris, i got to let you know, I have not received a paycheck in six months. I'm like, Betty. And she says, I thought for sure I was done. When I got to the point where I had nothing, like nothing in the bank account, I used up all my savings, I was done. And she said, Chris, it was, it was as if God was supernaturally depositing money into my account. She says, I don't even understand how it happened. I knew, my, I knew the numbers, and, and I should have been broke. And she said, and every time I would go to pay a bill, there was money in the account for the bill. She goes, miraculous. That, I mean, that was, that was God. And he said, time and time again, I found myself at the very end of the six months that, in desperate circumstances. But she goes, I have no idea how it happened except that God intervened. And he provided for every need, and I am still above water. And then God gets her a job in Naples, and she moves to Naples. We weren't very happy about that one. But she said to me, she goes, you know, now, because of this time of incredible desperation in my life, she goes, I look back at that time now, and she's, I, I realize what God did. And she says, I, knew, I now have a new message, and I, I am telling people about how God is faithful, and he is, he's a God of provision, and he's wonderful, and you just got to trust him. But the truth of it is, folks, <laughs> those times of desperation are not fun, are they? I mean, you think about Jairus' life. I mean, Jairus, I'm sure, didn't enjoy seeing his daughter so sick that she was about to die. I, I don't think he enjoyed that part of his life, and I don't think he liked those desperate circumstances. But the desperate circumstances drove him to the feet of Jesus Christ, and it gave him the opportunity to see Jesus Christ give the life of his daughter back to him, even though she was dead. <laughs> Jairus and his wife personally witness Jesus bringing their daughter back to life. And now they know Jesus in a very different way. He's not just a rabbi and a teacher. He is the person who can bring life out of death. And not only did he believe that Jesus could, could heal her daughter, but now he believes he's somebody else, and now his eternity, and so is his wife, and the little their eternities are changed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. The desperate times are not fun. But what God will do is he will put you in those situations to show you something about him you did not know before. To show you what a powerful God he is. And I'm sure that the woman didn't enjoy bleeding for 12 years. I mean, I'm sure that was a nightmare. But that desperate situation took her to the point where she actually was healed by Jesus Christ. And now she has a faith in him and her eternity has changed because of that. When he shows up in your life in such a way that you stand back and you go, wow, that was God. Holy moly. And folks, that normally happens in difficulty. And that's when God shows you who he is. As we sang this morning, that he is a God of, of power, inexhaustible power. And that's available to us, as Danny had said this morning. It's, it's for us. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, the, the woman, we might call her a power drainer, right? Because out of all of the crowd, she was the only person who transferred power from the person of Jesus Christ to herself. The conduit through which that power transferred was her faith. A faith that was born out of difficult circumstances. And so you're saying to me, perhaps, okay, so, you know, so this, 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 this power was transferred, and, 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 and she did it uh, because of this, this amazing faith, and, uh, you know, she was rewarded for it. You know, and let's look at he Hebrews chapter 11, because I think Hebrews chapter 11 is a perfect picture of this woman. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Earnestly seek him. That's actually a, a compound word, to seek. To earnestly seek, it means to, um, the word in the original text means to search for something without, without stopping until you find what you're looking for. It's, uh, it's to search with uh, inexhaustible effort, right? I, I, I bought a pair of those uh, ear, uh, 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 AirPods, right? And uh, the, the uh, best invention. I mean, they're awesome, right? They're wireless. You stick them in your ears. You answer phone calls. You listen to music. I love these AirPods. I lost them one day. Right after I bought them, I lost them. And let me tell you, my wife thought I was possessed, right? I love these things. And I'm never without them. I barely talk on the phone now without them. They're so awesome. I lost them. And I turned our entire house upside down. I turned my office upside down. I turned my car upside down. I mean, I looked through every nook and cranny to find out where these things were. And they're not cheap. So I, I, my, all through my house and, and, and uh, you know, finally, I'm like, where else can I look? And I'm sitting on the couch and I'm... I'm really bummed out. And they even had to find your earpod, the iPod, AirPod things on your phone. And it showed that the last time I used them was at the gym. And I'm like, yeah, if I dropped them at the gym, they're gone, right? I go to the gym. I really do, honestly. So, <laughs> so I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm saying to Missy, I'm like, I don't know where these things could be. I've looked everywhere. And then I found them where all lost things go, in the crevice of the couch next to me, right? They had fallen out of my pocket, and there they were. I don't think I've ever looked for something so intently as I have with those AirPods for a very long, that's what that word means. It means to look for something and, and, and exhaust all efforts. And so the text says that, that he rewards those who earnestly, you might even use the word, desperately seek him. That's the reward is. The reward for this woman, but she was healed. And she was healed because that desperate, earnest faith sought him. And sought him in such a way like nobody else in that crowd. And that's what transferred the power. And that's what healed her. So you say to me, well, are you saying then that if I just have enough faith that God will heal me? Be careful. Should I come to God with earnest faith if I want him to work in my life, whether it's a healing or whatever else? Yes, absolutely. Will he heal you? If you just have enough faith? Maybe. And I say maybe because we're experienced in ministry. You pray your guts out for people and they die. You pray your guts out for people and they're healed. Will God heal people if it glorifies him and it fits his agenda for you? Yeah. But Paul wasn't healed, right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he's got this thorn at his side. And it's a handicap that and he, and he comes to God and he says, Oh, God, please remove this. And the text says that he did it. He petitioned him three times. God said, no. He didn't say to Paul, well, Paul, you know what? If you prayed five times, maybe I would have done it. If you just prayed a little bit more, if you were a little bit more earnest in your prayers, I would have taken that thorn. Mm -mm. No, it's because God said, that's what I want for you. You may not understand it, but Paul, you know what? My grace is sufficient for you because my power is perfected in your weakness. So if I see fit that you not healed, it's all good. You know, I think sometimes it, we get, let's say this, the older I get, the more I realize, I believe, I should say, that God is really not all that interested in my temporal life here. And we get so caught up and, oh, God, heal this, and God, heal this, and God, do this, and do that, and, and we pray for that. And, and, and 
that's fine. I mean, Scripture says that we can come to God with our requests and, and heal that. But on, honestly, folks, the longer I live, I think the more I realize, and this is just me, the more I realize how really I think uninterested he is in whether I have arthritis or not, or whether I'm, I'm got COVID or I'm sick or whatever. I think there's way more things that are, things are way more important that, that he wants me to be earnest about, like desperate praying for. The truth of it is, is we're all going to be six feet under. We all end up there. That's a cheery thought on a Sunday morning, isn't it? Right? It, it, some of us go before others, but we all get there. And you know, the fact of it is, is that we have ailments, and the older you get, the more you got, and that's just the way it is. But eventually, we, we all end up in the same place. This body does anyway, and so I think if as a believer in Christ, to realize who I am petitioning, the God of infinite power. Do I want to access that power to uh, ease my arthritis pain or to, you know, I have a flu or, or whatever? Or do I, want to, do I want to access that power? Do I want to seek him earnestly with faith? to give me the boldness to open my mouth and invite my neighbor to a Bible study. Isn't that more important? Or open my mouth to a neighbor and, and say and, and share Jesus Christ with them because I'm scared to death. If, if I'm petitioning a God who has inexhaustible power and resources, that, that's what I want power for. My aches and pains, whatever. Right? I mean, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Do you really believe that? Seriously. If you believe that, the sooner I go, the better. Seriously. That's what that verse means. And Paul even says, he says, I prefer to leave this body and be at home with the Lord. That's way better than being here. But he says, you know what? If he still has me here, then that means I just get to serve him more and get to build my treasure in heaven. It's like Social Security, isn't it? I mean, the longer that you work, the more Social Security you have on the back end. So if I live longer, it's just more opportunity for me to build my treasure in heaven and for God to use it. So... If I'm calling upon a God whose power is inexhaustible, what am I asking him for? He can do anything. Imagine you get a letter from the local car dealership and they say, listen, bring in your junker and we'll trade you for a brand new car. No strings attached, no money. We're going to give it to you free. Just bring in your junker. And, you know, you've got an old, you know, 1986 Yugo and... You know, you're driving this thing around, and it's a piece of junk, and so you get this letter, and you go, wow, and it's legit. I mean, they're going to give you a new car. Just bring your Yugo in. And so on the way to the car dealership, you're, you notice that your Yugo is running a little rough, and it sounds like you've got a hole in your muffler. Are you going to pull off to the muffler shop and get a new muffler? Or let's say the check engine light comes on on your way to the dealership to trade it in. Are you going to stop at the mechanics and, and, and have him fix your check engine? light? Or let's say your airs, your tires are a little low on air. Are you going to stop and put air in your tires? No. Why? Because you're going to trade that junker in and you're going to get something brand new. I'm going to trade this junker in and I'm going to get something brand new. So why am I so consumed with trying to keep this temporal tent healthy and alive and we have more things to be concerned about folks and we have a God who has promised us the power to do it have you ever flown over a large city at night like New York or even Atlanta right and are you isn't it amazing that when you're flying over these cities that you know all of the lights that are on at night 
And you look down and you go, how much power does it require to light up a big city like that? I mean, that's amazing, right? And, and it really is. It's, it's crazy that this country can produce so much power and we can accomplish so many things and run so many machines and, and that's a lot of power. But with all that power, even if you were to combine all of it, we can't make blind people see. And if you were to combine all of that power, we can't raise people from the dead. But he can. That's his power. The Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 3. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That power, folks, that rose him from the dead <laughs> is available to me. In fact, he says this in Ephesians chapter 1. Watch. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who what? Believe. So that power that God has is available to you and me. It's that power that rose Christ from the dead. It's the power that makes blind people see. So what are you asking him to do? I mean, you live in life just kind of bumping into him every now and then, kind of going through the motions, weeks, months, years. Or do you earnestly seek him? Because it is that kind of faith that drains his power into my life. So whenever God takes you through that difficult time, that time of desperation, understand, as a believer in Jesus Christ, he's going to use that time to show you something about him you have never seen before. To show you a work in your life that you can use as a milestone for the rest of your life and refer back to that and say, man, this is what God did in my life. And that power, folks, is available to all of us. Let's pray. Our Father, we are um, here today again reminded of something that we all know, that you're a powerful God. But our passage this morning has kind of opened up our eyes to see that, that there's a way to tap into that. And that is through an earnest faith. Father, we thank you that you have made that available to us. And so when you take us through, you take us down that road that is difficult and painful and we find ourselves in a desperate time. Father, enable us to see what you're producing in us, that we might see this wonderful work that you're accomplishing in our lives and that it would produce a faith that would transfer that power. In Jesus' name, amen. You sing this with me again, please. Good stuff. Before you go, if you are relatively new to Livingstone Church and you've not filled out a visitor's card yet, 
We have a bunch of them on the back table. If you could fill that out, put in the offering box before you leave so that uh, we know that you have been here and we can stay in touch with you. We send out updates about things that are going on. And, and uh, if you're not getting those updates, put that card on the, in the offering box. Or you could do it the really cool way and text uh, Living Stones to 84576. Okay? And that'll, that'll bring you into our flock note platform and you can sign up. You can register with us and then you can even sign up for small groups and things like that. Okay? We have uh, small groups here at Livingstone. We've been talking about them. There's a list of them on the back table, so take a picture of that. And join one, guaranteed, a lot of fun. Youth group is here at on 6 o'clock on Wednesday night, and they've been hearing great things about what God's doing in that group through Tom. And uh, if you have kids that age, drop them off. We don't pass a plate here at Livingstone. Uh, if you wish to honor God with your tithes and offerings, we have offering boxes in the back, as you know. Many of you, most of you are giving online, and there's instructions on how to do that. Also, there are, right next to the offering boxes, there are these theological papers that Doc Calhoun writes. And once again, if you want to increase your theological IQ, I would grab one of those. He's got a new one out about accountability and something. I haven't read it yet. But it's good. They're all good. God is good. And all the time, God is good. I came here to tell you something. I came here to let you know. I came here to tell you something. I came here to let you know. Yeah, I came to drop this baggage that's been dragging down my soul. And I came here to tell you something. I came here to let you know. Yeah, I found some forgiveness and the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I came here to tell you something. I came here to let you know.